Thank you. So we have 20 minutes to shoot here. Oh yeah, the, the title of course is Is Magnetism Relevant to Cooper Superconductivity? Yes, I changed the title a little bit to ah. Is uh, Super Exchange Relevant ah, to ah, 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 Cooper okay. Superconductivity? Okay. And this is a uh, work that uh, accumulated uh, um, many collaborators, so I won't go through the list, but I will just uh, start with the beginning. The beginning is uh, uh, the last uh, paper that Anderson uh, put on the web. It didn't bother, this is the late Anderson, he didn't bother to typeset, it looks like this. And he wrote that uh, uh, the dominant interaction, coupling the superconducting electron pairs in the same, is the same, super exchange spin coupling, which causes the uh, undoped cooperates to be antiferromagnetic. So Anderson assigns superconductivity to the super exchange. So this was quite a long time ago. And recently, there is a, a few weeks ago, there was a paper uh, published in the Quanta magazine. It's a, a popular paper. Uh, and the title of the paper is High Temperature Superconductivity uh, Understood at Last. And the the, there is a sentence in the, in the paper that uh, new measurement matches a prediction based on the theory which attributes cooperate to superconductivity, uh, cooperate superconductivity to a quantum phenomena called super exchange. And this paper is reviewing the work of Anderson. So the beginning is a super exchange, the end in the super exchange. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to fill in the gap in between uh, the problem is that uh, scanning tunneling microscope, which is the work presented by uh, Seamus Davis, does not measure super exchange. It actually measures tr uh, charge transfer gap, but th they related the two because super exchange is a function of hopping, Hubbard U, and trans uh, charge transfer gap. And the super exchange increases with T and decreases with U and decreases with, F with the transfer gap. So you can try to make connection between superconducting properties and any one of those. And if it works, then you can blame the super exchange. Uh, what I'd like to do is to fill in the middle, as I mentioned, and I will present experiments that do measure super exchange and relate them to superconducting properties. Uh, I will I'll start with two experiments that are not mine. I will just show that I'm not alone. Uh, one on the mercury-based cooperates, the other on the bismuth-based cooperates, and then I will go to the, um, our work, which is on the charge transfer uh, cooperate. And the final message with all of this will be that, the, uh, indeed, the emerging picture is that the super exchange is the decisive factor for TC, uh, regardless if of its constituents. So you can change the tra charge transfer, you can change J, any other way, but this is the one that is decisive. J is the one that counts. Um, okay, so just before diving in, I want to mention that uh, in the metallic superconductor, the key that solved the problem was the experiment of TC versus uh, atomic weight. And if you make a plot of TC versus one over a root square of the atomic weight, you see a linear dependence. The only way to see linear dependence properly is with tin. For the others, you need a magnifying class to see the linear dependence. But if you uh, uh, make a plot, a line through the origin, in all three cases, the line goes through the points. What I'm trying, what I'm trying, my message is, what I'm trying to say is that if you compare different materials, there is no linear dependence. So you have to be able to change one parameter at a time, not more than one parameter at a time, because materials are complicated. And so uh, all the experimentalists that try to find any correlation between TC or any uh, superconducting property and J try to change as, uh, uh, the smallest number of parameters possible. So this is a work by uh, Wang et al. This is on the uh, mercury compounds. You have two mercury compounds here as an example. Uh, these are, when you go from one to the other, you don't manage to chemically stay so fixed. You, the, you actually increase the number of planes, but they manage to uh, measure the paramagnon dispersion with resonance inelastic scattering. 
And these are the dispersion relations, and it's hard to see with this projector, but uh, the scale here is larger than the scale here. And this material is a higher TC. So the par paramagnet, basically what they would say is the J here is bigger than the J here. And uh, uh, the mercury 1212 has a higher TC than the mercury uh, 1201. So there is a correspondence between TC and the dispersion relations of the magnon. And they attempted to put, in addition to their own measurement, many materials on one graph and to plot TC as a function of J. But I don't think it's a fair comparison because really the materials are very, very different from one to the other. If you stay in one material, then the comparison is fair. The same happens with the bis uh, bismuth uh, series. And I'm showing you two experiments from two uh, groups. And again, when you want to change uh, super exchange, you have to do more than, uh, more than you want. So you actually increase the number of layers. But uh, when you look at the magnon dispersion, really the materials with low TC have smaller J or smaller magnon dispersion than the material with high TC. And uh, uh, this group, uh, uh, the, 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 the Ruin group also measured tran uh, charge transfer gap. So uh, I don't know if you can see this, but this is J as a function of TC. And again, there is some linear behavior. They claim that they have mani managed to change J via the charge transfer gap. So uh, our experiment is done a little bit differently. We work in a material that is called charge compensated. Uh, it's a, it is a long chemical formula, and it's called for short calabalaco. And uh, what happens in this calabalaco is that you replace calcium by barium. The amount of lanthanum actually stays constant. So, so when you do this, you maintain the epoch structure. You don't change the structure. You don't change the number of planes. The ma material is always tetragonal. And you can overdope and underdope. <coughs> and you have a huge TC transition, TC max, a variation as you change X. And what you actually do, barium and lanthanum have the same valence. So uh, you don't change the valence of the material. You do something else other than changing the valence. And this uh, compound allows you to change TC max with minimal structural changes. So what is it that you, OK. What is it that you do? Actually, when you increase x, you move positive charge from the yttrium side to the barium side. As a consequence, the oxygen is moving up, and the bond becomes flatter. So this is not just words. We actually measure the unit cell length and the unit cell buckling angle. And the family, the, the, red, the, red, uh, compa the red color represents the family with the highest TC. So the red have the, sh the most uh, unbuckled bond, the straightest bond, and the shortest bond. So two effects work together to make the super exchange uh, stronger. And this is a uh, paramagnon dispersion. Uh, it's a relatively new work in the, in the underdoped Calabalaco material. And so x equals 0.4 is the material uh, with highest TC. x equals 0.1 is with the lowest TC. And again, we see that uh, the magnon dispersion has, uh, is more energetic. So if you were to fit this with a, a fixed J, for the family with the highest TC, you will get a larger J. But this experiment was done in the underdope regime. So uh, if you want to criticize and say that uh, underdope it doesn't count, you can do the same experiment also in the maximum optimally dope regime. And again, in the optimally dope regime, Riggs does not provide clean, clear peaks. The peak is uh, actually constructed from one magnon and two magnon, but you can still take the average position of the peaks as all the other experiments that I show you did, and indeed you end up with the red family having higher energies 
than the black family and the TC of red is bigger than the TC of black. So we claim that there is positive correlation between TC and the super exchange. Now, this experiment requires single crystals, requ RICS, requ requires single crystal, requires cleaving. If you do the experiment twice, you don't get the same results. What I want to show you are muon experiments that are done on powders. Powders as are easier, they much less demanding in terms of separate preparation, but you can get the same answer. So this is a, a mu SR. If this is the fa a phase diagram, this data set is taken when you cool, you look at the muon rotation frequency and you cool a sample here. So as you cool, you get muon behavior, muon spin, that doing nothing and then starting to rotate. So you can characterize this as an appearance of Niel temperature. You can also do the experiment somewhere here. This is the, uh, used to be called the glass phase. So you don't get rotations of the muon, but you do get a phase transition. And we, we can take, uh, characterize a critical temperature here, but we will call it with a different name. Here it will be called TNL. Here in the past we used to call it TG, T glass. Now it's the spin density wave. Uh, we measured plenty of samples and you can get a very rich phase diagram and what you see is that the family with the highest TC, the red family, has also the highest TNL. Okay? But it's a little bit uh, confusing because as you underdoped, first it has the lowest TNL, then there is a jump into the ordered phase and then it goes up and up and there is a crossing point. Uh, some experiments were done like this. Not us, but in different materials, and this lead to an erroneous result. So there are results in the literature which one has to work out and understand that you have to keep on undoping in order to go past the crossing point. Uh, but if you are not making this mistake, then there is clear correlation between TNL and TC max, and it's a very simple observation. Okay, but there is more to the story than th just this. You can take this phase diagram and stretch the doping axis. And if you just stretch the doping axis, you, you, you clearly see that uh, uh, the Niel temperature is correlated with TC. So there is some issue here is what do we mean by doping? When I put oxygen, it doesn't mean that I put a hole in the plane. Not every oxygen puts a hole in the plane. And what I did here by stretching is actually converting from, from oxygen in the chain layer to holes in the plane. That's all I did in this uh, stretching. And this has been confirmed by nuclear quadrupole measurement. And I don't have time to show. Uh, in fact, you can take the MUSR uh, data and extract the super exchange parameter from it. So you have two numbers, you have TNL and you have muon rotation frequency and from two numbers you can extract in plane J and out of plane J. No time to explain how it works but you can and oops and if you and if you do that you will get the TC max is a linear function of J going through the origin and amazingly quantum chemists, those that solve the can also calculate uh, J and uh, th there is some randomness in the J because doping is not you know, uniform, but the, the numbers are very similar to the numbers that we are getting from our MUSR measurement. And of course, they're also getting that the X equals 0 0.1 is, uh, uh, sorry, th they, their colors is switched. So their X equals 0 0.1 has a lower, the X equals 0 0.1 has a lower J than the X equals 0 0.4 which is these two points. So the conclusion so far is that uh, TC really scales with the super exchange and uh, uh, we can do a little bit better. We can take the scale, the stretched phase diagram that I showed you before and nor extract J from e for each sample. I call it J effective because J is defined only for the, com for the parent compound. If you have doped compound, the number is not J, it's some average J. So if you take J effective 
and the, the other critical temperature and divide by Tc max, all four, four families fall on top of each other. So really the energy scale that sets everything is the J itself. One more step to go. So you can also, we can also measure a Yumura plot on Kalabalako. And when you do Yumura plot on Kalabalako, there is an interesting result that there is no boomerang effect. If you measure Tc as a function of carrier density or, or uh, uh, stiffness, the line goes up and down on itself. This uh, result was uh, obtained on LASCO with a 10 times better or maybe 100 times better experiment by Bozovic with 2,000 points here. But the idea is the same. The Yumura plot is one line that misses the origin. So if you believe Kalabalako obeys the Yumura plot, and if you believe the TC scale with J, and you combine these two results, and you, ex you ignore the offset, you have to come to the conclusion that TC is set by two numbers, super exchange, carrier density, and if this is 1,000 Kelvin, and this is 0.1% doping, 0.1 doping, then you get a, a 100 Kelvin superconductor. So this brings me to the end. All the measurements that we performed support this conclusion. The TC is set by two numbers, super exchange and superconducting carrier density. Uh, I did not have time to show you, but we did measure the charge density wave in Calabalaco, and it anti-correlates with TC. So the family with the highest uh, TC has the weakest uh, charge density wave, and the family with the lowest TC has the strongest charge density wave, so charge density wave really works against superconductivity. And we also measure the pseudo gap, and it seems to be a partial. The <coughs> energy scale for superconductivity is impartial to the energy scale of the pseudo gap. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being on time. Because we have to respect the online, because next we have a couple of questions. A uh, very interesting talk. I have a question. Uh, can you relate magnetic correlation lengths with the super exchange value? Because if you have short range order and not long range order, I would say that it is more important than the spectrum of magnets. So, uh, I don't know how to... Ext so, you are, you are asking me, uh, I think... Oops. You're asking me to, to work out here, as far as I'm concerned, the magnetic correlation is infinite. Yes. Here, it's not infinite. Yes. But I don't know to tell you what it is. Okay. Okay, Thanks. quickly, now we, we have to dash off. So, the super exchange on the orbital side, let's assume that you have a localized carriers to do the super exchange, otherwise, you wouldn't have a super exchange. The super exchange, by word super exchange, I mean assume that you took two spins next to each other. This is the super exchange. And where these two spins are sitting, if not on the couple? No, if you, you, you started with 100% of spin. You took, knocked out 25%. There are some left. The super exchange is between two neighboring. I just want to say that... I would just like to say that the super exchange in the coup rates uh, does not depend on the big U. It is a purely kinematic effect uh, which goes like T P D to the three uh, to the four over delta P D to the third. So you what you have in your super exchange is a proxy for the copper oxygen splitting delta P D. Yeah. Okay, but, but, but these are all that's all fine, but we have to go now and uh, but, but can I answer? Sure. Okay, so <laughs> someone has to measure you. I mean, what you say makes sense, and okay, but someone has to measure you, and there is a way to measure you, and I will uh, tell you the answer in the, in, in a year.